Hello, everyone, and welcome to Algebra 2. This is section 7.3 on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. And then we'll actually continue our work graphing from 7.2 at the end. All right, so this is actually a concept that you are really familiar with. If I gave you 3x is equal to 18, I suspect that everybody would, without hardly thinking, would divide both sides by 3 to get rid of the x. Why would you do that? Why on that one would you divide, and on this one, you would subtract? Well, it has to do with inverse operations. Multiplication and division are inverse operations. They cancel each other out. So we're going to expand that thought and use it to simplify rational expressions. If you have two things that are being multiplied, in this case, 2 times x plus 1, and then on the bottom, you have another x plus 1 being multiplied, this time times x plus 3. You can cancel them because they are factors. And this becomes 2 over x plus 3. Now, you do have to factor. You can't cancel terms. The reason that this works over here is because it's multiplication. If it's not multiplication, you can't do it. So the steps are really simple. Factor and then cancel. So you can't factor the x plus 4, but of course you can factor x squared minus 16 into x plus 4 times x minus 4, and now you can cancel. Now don't forget to put a 1 there to hold the place, 1 over x minus 4. You might want to try that next one on your own. I factor x minus 3 times x plus 1 over x minus 3 times x plus 2, and then I can cancel. So if you're confused as to why you can't cancel the terms, you can't do that. People do it all the time. Um, think about it this way. If you had 5 plus 3 over 5, that would make 8 over 5. But if you cancel the 5s, you're telling me that that answer is 3. 8 over 5 is definitely not equal to 3. Addition and division do not cancel each other out. So this would be x plus 1 over x minus x plus 2. Now sometimes people get this far, and then they're like, oh, I can cancel the x's. No, you cannot cancel the x's. Okay, you can only cancel factors. Now your book is going to make a little extra note on your homework. It's going to say x is not equal to negative 1. Technically, x can't be negative 3 either. But your book makes this comment because it's saying, well, but if x is negative 1, you'd have 0 over 0, which looks like it cancels, but you can't let x be negative 1. That would be wrong. I do not expect you to do this, okay? Don't worry about it. We all know you can't divide by 0, but I'm not going to add that burden to your homework. So you can just stop here for your answers. Okay, so let's do some examples. So on this first one, these are actually meant to be the easy examples, but sometimes this kind actually trips people up more than you might think. So I'm going to show you two different ways to do it, and then you can decide which one you like better. The first way that people seem to be the most successful with is to actually do the multiplication. Remember, numerator times numerator and denominator times denominator. That would give me 18 x to the 6 y to the 4th. And then the denominator, 8 times 9 is 72, x to the 4th, y squared. And then you just do each thing in turn. 18 over 72 reduces to 1 fourth. x to the 6th over x to the 4th reduces to x squared. And y to the 4th over y squared reduces to y squared. There is nothing wrong with that system. However, there's going to be some of you that say, yeah, but couldn't I just do some of that canceling beforehand? Because think about it. If you're going to multiply this together, that's almost the opposite of factoring. Factoring is where you try and take it apart. So you can think of this as one giant fraction, numerator times numerator, where things are already in a slightly factored form. Just like 24 factors into 6 times 4, x to the 6th that we eventually put it to can stay x to the 5th and x. That's a factored form. 
And the reason you might want to do that is so you can simplify easier. You can say, oh, look, I can cancel that X with that X. And these, this three X's with three of these, and I'm left with X squared. Instead of actually multiplying first and then simplifying, you could just kind of simplify right on there. And then these two Y's are going to cancel with one of these, and I see there's just Y squared left. The numbers are a little bit trickier, but actually I prefer to do the numbers while they're separated instead of multiplying out first and then trying to reduce. Because look, right here I can just say, well, 3 and 9 reduce to 1 third, and 6 and 8 reduces to 3 fourths. Oh, and now I have a 3 on the top and the bottom. I can cancel them, and the only thing I see left is a 4, oh, which is on the bottom. So the thing to remember, though, is that some people get lost. So even though the two answers are the same, some people make, are just too messy for this. They, they start to cross things off, and they can't keep track. And that person should do it the blue way at the start. But if you think you can just cross things off, you can go ahead and do that. But most examples are not going to be like that. In my opinion, most people are actually more successful with this kind here where it's just straight factoring. So we'll do the easy ones first. This is x plus 5 times x uh, minus 5. This can't be factored. It's x plus 3. You can think of this as separate factors. This is 2 times x times x, but I'll leave it as x squared. But this one right here... You may recall that I personally think that it's easier if you always put it in descending order and always factor out first. So I would take out not just the 2, but the negative 2 and the x. I always like that first term to be positive. And then that gives me x minus 5. Remultiply that. Negative 2x times x is negative 2x squared. Negative 2x times negative 5 is 10x. So I feel confident now. So this is negative 2x times x minus 5. And now I can cancel things. I don't have to write it as one big fraction, although I can, because they're just all getting multiplied together. So I see a 2 and a 2. I see one of these x's and one of these. And I see an x minus 5 and an x minus 5. That leaves me on the numerator with just the x plus 3. And the negative, that's what I said about sometimes people miss things. And on the denominator, I'm left with this x plus 5. And a little hard to see, but there's still an x there. I only canceled the square. So you could leave your answer like that. Or you might do negative x minus 3 over x squared plus 5x. Both answers are good. There's nothing wrong with either of them. Just different choices for how to write it out. Okay, number three is hard because you have to remember a formula that we learned way back. And that formula is A cubed minus B cubed is A minus B times A squared plus AB plus B squared. So hopefully you have an appendix of some kind where you've been writing formulas down through the year and this would be on it. But on the outside chance that it's not, I'm going to rewrite both of them for you. And this is our chance to practice it. So I'm going to change this to x plus 5 over, so this is a cube, and a is x, because x cubed would be a cubed. And then you can ignore the sign. You're just looking at the number 1. The sign is built into the formula. That negative tells me I'm going to use the top one. So it's going to be a minus b times a squared plus a times b, so 1 times x, plus b squared, 1 squared, which is just 1, times, and when you have a single thing, remember that you can make it into a numerator over 1. That helps a lot of people write it in the correct spot. And then I can cancel. And I'm left with x plus 5 over x minus 1. And again, your book will you talk about x not being equal to 1. You don't want to divide by 0. Um, but I think you already are very familiar with that.
So now we're going to move on to division. So division is great because literally it's almost the same. The only difference is that you have to add the flip step, but then it's exactly like the problems we just did. So I personally think that you guys being smart are capable of flipping and factoring in the same step. So this one I'm going to factor to 5 times x minus 4. And this one, since I have to rewrite it anyway in factored form, I'm also going to flip this. So this one I'm going to put on top x minus 4 times x minus 2. And then this one, I'm going to do my factoring out. Don't forget that as a method of factoring. x times x minus 2. So I flipped, but I still factor and cancel. That's still how you're going to do these. Okay, so what can I cancel? I see an x minus 4. Remember, this is just like one big fraction because you're just going to multiply the numerator times the numerator. You don't have to remultiply it all as one fraction. And then I can cancel out my x minus 2s and my x's. And the numbers don't reduce. So I'm left with a 4 on top and a 5 on bottom. That's it. There you go. All right, you might want to try the next two on your own. But of course, I am going to do them for you. So this is technically over 1. So I'm going to factor. A little bit harder factoring now because I'm going to have a 2x and an x. Remember that you're trying to pick something where your inners and your outers are going to add up to positive 3. So I'm going to make this plus and this minus. Over 6x, that can't be factored any further. But you can think of the 6 and the x separately. And then I'm going to flip. And I'm also going to factor this one. And again, don't forget about factoring out as a method of factoring. x times 2x plus 5. My 2x plus 5s cancel, but unfortunately, that's it. So I'm going to write my x minus 1, and then when I put these together, it's going to be 6x squared. All right, we have one more to practice on. So I'm going to factor as I flip. This one doesn't flip. It's the first one. Ooh, I'm actually going to factor this. Remember, I always like to write it in descending order. And if my first term is negative, I always factor out the negative. Now I'm going to flip. That means that this is going to go to the top. So x minus 8 times x plus 4 over another factoring out. I'm determined to get you guys to learn it, right? x times x plus 9. And then I see x plus 9s are both there. I see the x minus 8s are both there. And I think that's it. So 3 times x plus 4 over my negative and my x. Now, it doesn't matter if you write the negative on the top or the bottom. Remember that negative 2 thirds is the same as negative 2 over 3. But it's also the same as 2 over negative 3. It's just that the general population doesn't write things that way. So you're probably going to want to write this as negative 3 times x plus 4 over x. I tend not to write it out front because if you're at all sloppy, you lose the negative and just think you've drawn a really long uh, equal to or fraction bar there. So that is actually it on section 7.3. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to section 7.2 and we're going to keep graphing. It's just that today we're going to make them harder. Last time, we always had a constant in the numerator. And when you have a constant in the numerator, it's just a little bit easier. But now, look, I'm going to have a, um, an actual polynomial in my numerator. So there are some nice, super easy steps to doing these. The first is we're going to find the x-intercept by setting y equal to 0. Remember that this is y. So when you set this equal to 0, think hard now. What is the only part of this fraction that can be equal to 0? It has to be the numerator because you can't let the denominator be 0. So in your head, you can think to yourself, well, if this is equal to 0, it's because x minus 1 is 0. So x is equal to 1. Or you can think to yourself, I'm just going to solve this by clearing fractions. And that'll also lead you to 
zero is equal to x minus one. So whichever way you think of it, the x-intercept is uh, one comma zero. The y-intercept is a lot easier. The y-intercept is when you let um, x be equal to zero. So y is equal to zero minus one over zero plus three, which is negative one-third. So the y-intercept is zero, negative one-third. To find the vertical asymptote, I'm going to set the denominator equal to zero because that's what it can't be. X can't be negative three. So this is your way of figuring out what is going to make the, bo the bottom or the denominator equal to zero. If X is negative three, that would be a problem, right? So I'm going to draw my wall there. I'm going to say, look, this is the one number. That graph is never going to be. It's a wall. It is not crossable. The horizontal asymptote, however, tells you end behavior. End behavior. And you're going to do that by doing A over C. So y is equal to, last time, it was always at 0, and it only moved up or down if we added a number. Well, now we're adding a number to the top and the bottom. So it's going to be y is equal to 1. I'm looking at this number here and this number here, the coefficients in front of the x's, and I divide them. So if it had been x minus 1 over 2x plus 3, then my horizontal asymptote would have been 1 half. I'm always looking at the coefficient over the coefficient. That's how you find the uh, horizontal asymptote using this formula. y is equal to a over c. So here's, here's my y is equal to 1. And there's my new origin. Even though it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been done the way uh, we did it last time, it still obviously creates a shift. So my domain is going to match my vertical asymptote. X is not equal to negative 3. Remember, these are always linked. And same with the range. My range is that Y is not going to be equal to 1. All right, so I draw my two branches of the hyperbola so that they pass through the points and approach the asymptotes. So let's actually plot the two points that I have. I have 1, 0 and zero negative one third. That is definitely enough to graph that branch. So I'm just gonna go like that, okay? I really just need one point on each branch and I'll be content. That means I need a point over here. So I didn't automatically get that. Sometimes you get lucky and your X and your Y intercept fall on different branches and then you've got your one point. If you do all this work and you don't have a point on the other branch, your only choice is to make a table. Now, because you want it to fall over here, you need x to be negative 4 or negative 5 or negative 6. So I'm going to choose negative 4. And that gives me negative 4 minus 1 over negative 4 plus 3, which is negative 5 over negative 1, which is 5. So negative 4, 5. Do I feel good about that? Absolutely. I was expecting it to come down and then go like that. Okay. Those two might not be perfect, but they're close enough. I really just want to, you to be able to do the basic shape with a couple good points and getting all the asymptotes correctly. Now, I realize that this was a lot to learn in one, so hopefully you're going to watch at least one more example and we'll go through all those steps again. So x-intercept is going to be something comma zero. If you think of it that way, it's, it's giving you the step of what to do. You want to let y be 0. So 0 is equal to 2x plus 1 over x minus 3. But the denominator can't be 0, so I'm really just going to solve this. And when I do, I get subtract the 1, divide by 2, negative 1 half. Right here. For the y-intercept, I'm going to let x be 0. This is zero comma something. That one you can pretty much do in your head, but I'll do it out for you. Two times zero plus one 
zero minus three. So negative one third. Zero, negative one third. I don't know, I have a feeling those are going to be on the same branch. We're going to have to make a little table. Vertical asymptote can be found by letting the um, denominator be equal to zero. So zero is equal to x minus three gives me x is equal to three. You just every single time let the denominator be equal to zero. And for the horizontal asymptote, it's always going to be y is equal to a number because it's horizontal. And you just have to look at these two numbers, 2 over 1, every time. And you get 2. So it's right there. So I can draw one of my branches already. But I need a point on my other branch. And when I go to make my table, if I pick 0, I've already plugged 0 in. I don't want that. To get on this branch, x has to be 4 or 5 or 6 or something like that. So if I plug in a 4, then I get 9 over 1. Ooh, that's really too high for me. 4 and 9, I can't reach that. But think about it. If it's way up here, it's coming down, right? So probably if I plug in a 5, it'll be lower. So when I plug in a 5, I get 11. I know I'm thinking that's not lower but 11 over 2, which is 5.5. .5. So at 5, it's there at 5.5. .5. So it must come down and then go like that. All right, if you think you're ready to try one on your own, make sure you stop this video and do that. I will give you a little hint here. I usually set this up first. If I do this, it kind of guides me through the problem. So x-intercept is when y is equal to 0. So 2x plus 5 over x plus 2 is equal to 0. But it's not that, and I can solve that in my head, negative 5 halves, which is negative 2 and a half. The y-intercept, I plug a 0 in for the x's, and I, I get 5 halves again, but this time it's positive. So 2 and a half. My asymptote is whatever would make the denominator 0. So x plus 2 is 0. x is negative 2. That is the one number. Ooh, maybe those two will be on different branches. And then y, you just have to look. It's right there, 2 over 1. Hooray! I don't have to make a table this time because I know it's going to come down like that. And go through that point and then this one's going to go down like that. I hope you're starting, I know it's still a little confusing me, but I hope you're starting to like it because uh, a lot of people think that these are pretty fun and easy to graph. Okay, next one. Uh, let's go ahead and set it up. Something comma zero, zero comma something, x is equal to, and then y is equal to. So I set the entire thing, the y, which is this, right, equal to 0. So 0 is equal to negative 3x plus 2 over negative x minus 1. It has to be the numerator that's equal to 0. And then I can solve that 2 thirds. If I plug a 0 in, it's going to cancel this term and cancel this term and give me 2 over negative 1, so negative 2. What would make this denominator equal to 0? I'm going to move the x to the other side if x is negative 1. So sometimes you can do that in your head. Like I can just look at this next one and say, well, when x is negative 1, without even trying. But when you don't know, just take the time to um, set the denominator equal to 0. And then the horizontal asymptote is these two numbers. So negative 3 divided by negative 1 is 3. I'm going to go ahead and plot everything I know. Here's my two asymptotes, 0 and 2 thirds. Oh, sorry, 2 thirds and 0 is right there. And 0, negative 2, darn. They're on the same branch. So I will have to make a table to find something on the other branch. And I have to pick negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. 
Now, remember what happened last time? We picked negative two and it was too high up. So, or I should say we picked close to the, you know, to our new origin, our new shift. So maybe I'll pick negative three. So that's negative three times negative three plus two is 11 over negative, negative three minus one is positive three minus one is two. So five and a half. Can I reach that? Yes. So five and a half. So it must come down and go through that. Okay, last one. So remember, I'm going to start out with filling in this little sequence of values here to make it easy for me to know what to do next. Then when I see x-intercept, I know I'm going to make the y be 0. 0 is equal to 3x plus 5 over x plus 1. You can either clear the fraction or just think to yourself, if a fraction is equal to 0, it has to be because the top is equal to 0 because the bottom can't be 0. And when I solve for that, I get negative 5 thirds. And then when you're solving for the y-intercept, x is 0. So if this is 0 and this is 0, I just get 5 over 1, which is 5. To find the vertical asymptote, you're asking yourself what would make the denominator equal to 0 because it can't be equal to 0. So the vertical asymptote is the line x is equal to negative 1, which is a wall. You're not going to cross it because x will never be equal to negative 1. And the horizontal asymptote is always this number, the coefficient on the numerator in front of the x over the coefficient in front of the denominator. So 3 over 1, which is 3. I draw both of my asymptotes and any other values that I got. So I got 0, 5 for my y-intercept and negative 5 thirds, which is negative 1 and 2 thirds, which is perfect. Negative 1 and 2 thirds is in this section. So this branch can be drawn through that point. And this branch can be drawn through that point, and I don't even need to make a table and find any extra points. All right, that is it for section 7.3 and this continuation of section 7.2 on graphing. Have a great day.